Greetings, greetings, friends out there in the universe. Uh, welcome on the World Wide Web, twitch.tv slash the Relics channel. We're so happy to be back. And we are here with my show, Sto Photos with Stories. Um, and uh, just as usual, I want to thank all the people that helped put this on. Pete Shapiro, Jonathan Healy, Stephanie May, um, Will Schward, Harrison Ezradi. We got our intern, uh, um, Joe Lentini. Uh, and our intern, Joe, is the guy that is going to be collecting any questions that you guys want to ask Ed at the end of the program. So you can put them in any place that uh, accepts comments where you're watching. Uh, I guess that's mostly the chat space on the Twitch feed. Um, send in your questions for Ed and he will do his best to answer them. Um, photos with stories. We're back here on twitch.tv. We've switched platforms. We're very, very excited to be here. Um, my next program is going to be on May 18th and that will be a Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm actually talking to a photographer who lives in Washington, D.C. His name is Chester Simpson. Chester was a Bay Area photographer for many, many years, cut his teeth here, and uh, has some incredible photographs from the, from the 70s and the 80s. And eventually he moved to Washington, D.C. His career did not stop. He did so much other stuff. He traveled abroad with the uh, uh, Bob Hope and the USO, is that what it's called? Um, doing all sorts of shows for, for the military overseas where he was photographing that. Um, so that is May 18th at 7 p.m. with Chester Simpson. Look him up on Facebook or the World Wide Web. I'm sure he has a website and you can check it out. But tonight here on Photos with Stories, we have Ed Perlstein, my old pal. I've known Ed for many, many years um, and uh, started seeing Ed's work way, way, way back in the day. Always loved it. We used a bunch of his photos in the Eyes of the World book that we published a few years ago. Um, if you don't have that book, there are only about nine or 10 copies left and it is gone. So if you want to get a copy of Eyes of the World, go to rockoutbooks.com and that's it. What's there on the website is it. So, um, and Ed's got photographs in there. So uh, check that out. All right, Ed, welcome to my show, Photos of Stories. We really appreciate you being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jay. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So you grew up on the East Coast. You're born in New Jersey. You did a little tiny bit of college in New York. Um, uh, but let's talk about rock and roll. Uh, you started hey, going to see music pretty early on, even though you only look like you're about 48. Um, you started seeing the uh, seeing rock and roll bands in the late 60s. I believe your first show was Cream at Madison Square Garden in 1968. Yep. You saw shows at the Fillmore East. You saw the Grateful Dead there. You saw, who else did you see at the Fillmore East? Oh my God, uh, Creedence, Jefferson Airplane, uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, all in uh, you know, 69, 70, 71 period. Great shows. How did you Allman you Brothers, twice. How did, you, how did you find out about these shows? Were you reading like alternative newspapers or listening to the radio, WNEW? Well, how did you find out about these shows? Uh, you know, hard to say. I think they did uh, uh, print advertisements and radio advertisements. There certainly was no internet. So, um, and tickets were on sale at record stores in New Jersey. So I could go there to get tickets or I headed into the city to get them. But uh... So you graduated high school in 71 and you moved to California in 72. So you were only about 18, 19 years old. And you made your way out west on your own, right? Or did you go with your brother? Because I think you lived with your brother for a while. No, that was afterwards. Actually, there were uh, six of us from high school that went out in a van and a car. We drove cross country and um, landed in uh, San Francisco in September 72. And I never turned back. Were you, were you, was San Francisco your destination because you knew that it was sort of ground zero for the Grateful Dead and the airplane and the ballrooms and Bill Graham and Chet Helms? Like you were aware of all that stuff and you're like, that, that's me. I was totally tuned into all that stuff. Uh, through some chemical enhancements, I realized that San Francisco was the center of the universe and I had to be here. It was just it. The, the music that I loved was here, the airplane, Quicksilver, the dead, um, this is where I needed to be. How old were you when you took LSD for the first time? Did I take LSD? I'm sorry. 
Um, I don't remember. I don't remember. 16, don't 17, worry, 18. Don't, don't My worry, kids are watching, Jay. Your kids, your kids are old enough to know that you've done those things. Yes, they are. That's all in the past. So it's, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. All right. So um, let's, let's look at some photos. The first one that we have up here is a, is a portrait of you, maybe taken by your wife. I swear to God, you look like you're trying out for the Velvet Underground, which is just so, so amazing here. And um, you look exactly the same um, uh, 50 years later. And uh, so I just want to really quickly kind of let the viewers know some of your greatest hits here that we're going to talk about, right? So we got Bob Marley, David Bowie in the 80s. We got Iggy Pop in the late 70s. Uh, the Grateful Dead on stage at, in Lindley Meadow, Golden Gate Park, free concert in 1975. Ed's going to talk about that show and how he ended up on stage shooting that. More Grateful Dead. We got Robert Plant. It looks like you're on stage when you took this photograph. Um, amazing. I love this photograph. I mean, this is Robert Plant, the golden god. And look at him wearing those spandex pants. Can you imagine if we were like front facing what the bulge in his pants would look like? Um uh, Freddie Mercury from Queen, uh, the beloved Yorma Kalkinen from the Airplane and Hot Tuna. Um, so that is some of the stuff that we're going to talk about in today's program with Ed. But it all starts with this photo of Jimi Hendrix at Madison Square Garden. Is that where this at is taken? Madison Square Garden, May 1969. He was actually had been he actually been busted two weeks earlier in Toronto and played this gig and. This was at Madison Square Garden, but it was a ro revolving stage. So I did, you know, I went up front to take a picture with my point and shoot camera, and then I had to wait until the stage went around and he be he came back to me to take another picture. Um, but I got a few few shots, and uh, there, are, you know, and this is just a, a point and shoot, like 126 camera kind of thing. Yeah, it's just a point and shoot. I wasn't doing 35 millimeter yet. Um, right. And uh, it was just a, a good capture uh, I was able to get. Right place at the right time. Here's another view of Hendrix on stage with the flash and the little uh, uh, instamatic camera. So in, in, in 73, you run into this guy and his name is Francesco Lupica. Yeah, and he invented what's called the beam, which is for any of you guys that are deadheads, you'll know that that's this instrument that Mickey Hart plays during the drums, uh, drum segment of, of Grateful Dead and Dead and Co shows. And this is the guy that that invented this instrument. But this is also one of those pivotal moments for you, because it's really how you got introduced personally to members of the Grateful Dead. And right. so you were already a deadhead. Did you just run into this guy in the park with this contraption set up and 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 just photograph him and befriend him? That's exactly what I did. Um, I didn't photograph him at the time, um, but uh, I ran into him at the park. I was living in Berkeley with my brother. We uh, managed a big apartment building in Berkeley, and my, actually, my brother ran into him in the park. He was set up. He set up this entire uh, presentation. Now, I don't know if, which picture you have up. The second one of Francesco uh, shows right everything. I mean, he put together uh, chimes and gongs and he built his own drum set. And the beam itself is 13 feet long. And he created these um, tree stumps to hold it. I mean, it was just in a beautiful organic uh, presentation and he would uh, he he built his own PA system with these 18 inch subwoofers to handle it um, and he was playing in the park quite, quite the presentation to walk just to run in, into and if he was playing in the park or a show or whatever and look at the legs on the beam these these wood the, branches. the trees the tree uh, stumps uh, that he create he they're real I mean <laughs> but but the thing is he was he was um, doing these presentation and um, uh, my brother found him, brought him home. He was actually living in his truck. We invited him to move in with us. Actually, he asked, but uh, we invited him and we're best friends to this day. Um, something of note is that he played drums in a band called Shanti with Zakir Hussein, the tabla player, and Ashish Khan, Ali Akbar Khan's son. And it was, it was really the first band that merged Indian music with rock and roll. 
and they would open for the dead. They'd play at the family dog at the Great Highway or, you know, other places, and they'd open for the dead. So one drummer, Francesco, knew Mickey, and, um, you know, they were good friends. And one day, Francesco knew that I liked the dead, and he said, come on, we're going to go for a ride, and he drives me to Mickey's ranch. And so he introduces me to Mickey. Mickey and I become good friends, and that's pretty much my connection. Right. And we'll see a bunch of photos of you and Mickey um, in a bit. I have one more question about uh, this. Um, do you think that's how Mickey met Zakir through Shanti? Uh, oh, most likely, yes. Right. Um, because Shant because Zakir had just come into the country uh, earlier uh, when Shanti was put together. The other thing of note, I want to tell a story about the beam for a second because okay, you know, I was I was ended up with living with Francisco Francesco rather, and um, uh, so I would end up being his roadie to tell, help him carry these things and set it up and everything like that. And one day we're at the Palace of Fine Arts, and he's doing his presentation, his show, and Mickey shows up with Dan Healy, the dead sound guy, and you know they start taking pictures and making drawings of the beam, and. Um, uh, you know, obviously they were intrigued enough to want to go create their own. Uh, the other story is that Dan Healy invited Francesco to play the beam through the wall of sound at the Dead's rehearsal studio on Front Street in San Rafael. And uh, they, they had like a mini wall of sound set up. They couldn't put the whole thing in there, but they had to have something to play, to rehearse and to practice and to uh, to test out the wall of sound. So we hooked up the beam in to the wall of sound and played it through the all those huge speakers. And it was amazing. And there weren't that many people there that day, but Garcia was there. And he, I still, in my mind, have the vision of his, his mouth just dropping, hearing this thing. Um, so that was a real nice experience. And the, and the reason you were there is because, you know, not only were you friends with Francesco, but you were sort of his roadie, right? Yeah. You would, you would help him set it up. And this is before you were a photographer. So, of course, you didn't really have a camera. Correct. Um, you were in Front Street to get a picture of Garcia with his jaw dropped to the ground. All right, let's move on to this next photo, which is a scaffolding. So in 1974, the Grateful Dead are using the Wall of Sound, speaking of which, and you drive down to Santa Barbara, get down there a little bit early, and you get recruited to help build the scaffolding and build the Wall of Sound. Right. right? So you're, you're at this point, you're 20 years old, you're going to see a dead show, and you end up building this. Um, uh, did you get paid to do that? or No. Or, they, 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 make just, you sign, they make you sign a liability insurance waiver. No, <laughs> <laughs> they needed bodies. And so I'm up on the top of the scaffolding, hooking things together. Uh, I mean, people look at the wall of sound and they're amazed by it, but they don't think about the, 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 the what goes into supporting it. You know, the stage, the scaffolding, everything that has to be, be done a day or two earlier before the dead arrive with their speakers and their amps and stuff like that. Right. And then here's a shot of the speakers being hauled up with the motorized chain poles. Yeah, then, that's a center, center speaker column right. before they put the rest of the speakers up. That's the first one that goes up. Here's this great shot of Garcia and Weir with the wall of sound behind him. And again, this is sort of pre you becoming a photographer. So he, these are also shot with your 126 camera, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. for those of you guys don't know or remember, right, there was two different versions of a point and shoot camera back in the day that Kodak made 1970s. One was a 110 Instamatic, and that gave you a really tiny little negative. And then there was the 126 um, uh, format camera, which was just a tiny bit smaller than a 35 millimeter frame, just a little bit. So, um, you know, with a good scan and with daylight, you've got a decent exposure and and it's actually, it's a, not, a, not a bad photo. So you already knew how to compose a photo and, and, and you had an eye for it. Um, you just didn't have the technology in your hands just yet. The other thing that's great about the shot of Garcia is that the Wolf guitar there has the sticker on it, not the inlay yet. Ah. Right? Early Wolf guitar. This was my first time with a backstage pass too. And what I did, I spent the entire time on the on Garcia's side of the stage. And once in a while, they'd let me uh, go in front of the stage, stand on a chair and take a few pictures. Um, but being on the side of the stage, I also had, had the opportunity to dance with Maria Moldar. So that was good. 
Right. Yeah. So here's the shot of Phil. And then here's from the side of the stage where you're over on Garcia's side. And right. of course, this is, you know, no Mickey in the band. So you're friends with Mickey, but he's really not even in the band anymore or at this point, you know, before he comes back. Um, you know, it's just just Bill on drums. Uh, but then we get to Golden Gate Park in 75 and uh, uh, you're shooting from up on stage. Right. So how'd you end up on stage? Like, you, you, I mean, this is the, they built a big giant fence around backstage. Did you sneak in there? What, like you're, you're 21 years old and you're on stage with the Grateful Dead. What's the story? Well, um, a good friend of mine, Bob Marks, who was a Grateful Dead photographer at the time, uh, taught me how to use a 35 millimeter camera that summer. Okay. So I started to play around with a 35 millimeter. He and I, he had the car. I didn't have a car. So he and I, cruised into San Francisco. We got there really early. They ended up building the backstage fencing around me. Okay. So you were and you were yeah, there were no passes. There were no laminates. There, were, there was nothing. It was just, I tried to be a wallflower. I tried to uh, not, you know, uh, uh, get in anybody's way. I didn't even try to go on stage for the starship who opened the show. I didn't try to go out to the audience afraid I might not be able to get back in. But when the dead, started uh, to get ready to play, I walked up the ramp to the stage. Rody sticks out his hand, says, who are you? I said, I'm shooting for Mickey. There he is. Ask him. And he just let me go. So uh, I, I, Mickey didn't know I was there. And <laughs> Mickey didn't know I was shooting for him. It was just one of those white lies that you just tell to get where you want to go. That and, works. and, you know, the thing that's great about Mickey is that of out of all the band members in the Grateful Dead, past, present, future, Mickey's the guy that has always appreciated the photography. You know, I've done jobs for Mickey. You've done jobs for Mickey. Uh, Mickey really appreciate. And, you know, most of the other, most of the other band members are just like, ah, uh, another picture of us. You know, do you need more pictures? But Mickey still appreciates it, even to this day. And that, I, and that's one of the things that I love about Mickey is that he's supportive of it because he realizes that we're capturing his history and we're documenting his life, and 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 he's allowed that. You know, he's given me that kind of access, and so that's why, you know, he has everything he's done from all the stuff they did with the Rhythm Devils for Francis Ford Coppola, for, for Apocalypse Now, all the way through. He's always worked with photographers. But I have a photo in here that I want to show everybody, which is a photo taken by a photographer named Alvin Meyerowitz. And uh, there's the pink arrow pointing at Ed Perlstein, young Ed, sitting on stage. He's behind the little kid. He's not the little uh, eight-year-old. He's the he's the 18-year-old now, the 22-year-old sitting behind that kid. But I'm, I'm guessing that you got up on stage and you really didn't move around. You stayed on your side and you didn't, nope. you didn't like, you, didn't, you weren't climbing up on amps like Jim Marshall was doing. I wasn't about to get in any roadie's way. I stayed where I was the entire show. And I was happy that I was able to stay there and nobody, you know, kicked me out. So... Well, good. Well, it's good that Alvin was on the opposite side of the stage because I think Alvin did the same thing and he stayed on his side and you stayed on your side. So you guys got the, the cross photos. We'll have to look through some of yours for some pictures of Alvin as a young man. Uh, and then there's more stuff of Mickey that we have in here. And this is, again, just goes to show your relationship with Mickey. Uh, I believe that you said this one uh, is up, up at his barn with maybe his son in the background. And then this one is a pretty famous one that's been in books and magazines. Trespassers will be eaten. And then, of course, there's this really well-known shot of, of Mickey and, and Gerilyn Brandelius, who was his common law wife. They were never married, but they consider themselves husband, husband, wife. And, uh, of course, we lost Gerilyn just uh, um, sometime in the last year, I guess. I don't know. It's all a blur with the lost year that we just had. But yeah. fairly recently, and I'm pretty sure that this is the photo that Mickey even posted on social media yeah. to sort of announce the death of, you know, longtime Grateful Dead family member, uh, Gerilyn Brandelia. So and she's wearing the Rolling Thunder shirt. Um, uh, but, you know, really just goes to show your relationship. Here's a backstage shot of Bob and Jerry. Where is this one? Is this the Cow Palace? This is the Cow Palace, New Year's Eve, 1976. And, and they were that, waiting to go on. And is this uh, Mickey giving you backstage passes? This is either Mickey or... BAM magazine in 1976, I started to work with a brand new magazine that came out called BAM, Bay Area Music Magazine. And for the third cover that needed a picture of Bob Weir. 
So they contacted the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead said, call Ed. And which was a great thing because I would have never known about the magazine. So I started to work for the magazine, which gave me access, you, uh, press passes or seats or wherever I needed to be. And as you know, access is key. Yes, indeed. Um, without a doubt. Um, this next photo, pretty straightforward picture of Garcia playing Wolf, but it's classic because Garcia is wearing a tie dye in the 70s. He wore some tie dyes in the early 70s, the 60s, early 70s. But this late, this is about 78, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, From January 78. Uh, and, and he's got a tie dye on, but, but no color film with you that night? Nope. Nope, unfortunately. Who would have thought? <laughs> right. Jerry would be wearing. So this next photograph here is really very possibly my most favorite Grateful Dead live photograph by anybody. Um, it's got everybody in the shot. The, the action that's going on between Garcia, Weir, Kreutzmann, the it's obviously the end of the song, peak moment, you know, or, or, or a sugar mag or a not fade away. You know, it's something big is going on here. And this is at Winterland in, yeah. in yeah. 77? 77, March 77. So let's talk about Winterland a little bit. For the sure. people who don't know what Winterland uh, is, it, was a, it started out as a ice skating rink, really, for the, for the ice follies way back when. Uh, so basically it had a rectangular open floor and it had balcony all the way around, including behind the stage. So this shot was taken from the balcony behind the stage. Just another interesting viewpoint. Um, and what's cool about the Winterland balcony, unlike a lot of more uh, uh, traditional auditoriums that were built for entertainment, is that the balcony is very low, right? Yes. You know, like I bet even over at Kaiser in Oakland, the balcony is probably 10 or 12 feet higher than this. So it almost gives you the impression that maybe you're standing on some road cases at the back of the stage or something like that. I mean, right. you're really only a few more feet above that. So it's, it is pretty remarkable. And this is a shot you took from the side balcony of the drummers with a couple of uh, um, uh, thugs in the background, smoking weed. I, I guess that's Phil Lesh on the left, Bill Graham, Ken Kesey and, and Parrish causing trouble lighting everybody up. Right. Yeah, this was New Year's Eve 77, and I was experimenting with long-distance flash from the side balcony, and it turned out pretty well. I happened to capture uh, Parrish lighting up Kesey and, and Graham and Lesh, and didn't expect that, probably didn't even see it in my lens. Right, it was probably pitch black behind them, but you were seeing the drummers. I'm guessing right. it was during the drum solo if Phil's not on stage. Exactly. Uh, so... And then, uh, and then this next shot, is this Winterland also? Um... No, uh, this is after Winterland closed, they needed other venues. And so there were a couple of big venues in the Bay Area. There was uh, Oakland Coliseum, and that's where this was taken. And you just told me the other day that this is probably taken on Donna and Keith's last uh, performance with the band. Yeah, yeah. Because you said this is February 78, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is their last show that they ever played with the band. And you just mentioned about, uh, so Winterland uh, was run by a guy named Bob Barsotti. I mean, it was run by Bill Graham, but Bob, I think was the house manager. Or, you know, he was, he was integral in it. And uh, uh, Bob went on to have a, a long, long career with Bill Graham, you know, 30, 30 years. And um, when Winterland closed, he was charged with the task of finding the replacement venue. And he is the guy that found the Oakland Auditorium Arena, which eventually became Henry J. Kaiser Auditorium. And right. I interviewed Bob on this program back in January of 2021. So just a few months ago. Yeah. And you can go on YouTube. And if you search photos with stories, Bob Barsotti, you can watch that episode. And it's all about sort of the history of Bill Graham Presents from Bob Barsotti's perspective. So it's a good, a good program if you're inter interested in kind of the history of San Francisco rock and, and, and Bill Graham in particular. Uh, portrait of Jerry Garcia. This one was taken at the Oakland Auditorium. Okay. He was about to go on stage. He was in a alcove. Um, there wasn't much light. There was some light from a lamp or an overhead coming in on, the, on, on one side. And he, he, he willingly posed for me. We were comfortable with each other at that point, And uh, I kind of like it. Yeah, it's cool. Um, here's uh, Betty. Uh, making some Betty boards. There's her Nagra tape recorder and a bunch of her gear and whatnot. 
I don't think there are too many pictures of Betty doing her recording. Um, right. So I was really happy I was able to get something like this. And where's this shot from? This one is Santa Barbara in um, 78. 78, I believe. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then uh, and then these are some other shots of uh, uh, is this uh, also Santa Barbara? Brent, is that his first? No, show? the one of Brent and the next few photos were taken at Spartan Stadium in San Jose in, in 79. Oh, right, now, right. This, on. I'm sorry. Right, right, this right. is Brent's first show. Right. I just got the date wrong. It is Brent's I first was show. on stage shooting and I shot across so I can get him looking at Jerry uh, and Bobby and Phil and, and playing playing the keyboards at this point. Parish and Ramrod, they sort of know your face, maybe your name. They know that you're sort of friends with Mickey. You got a camera. No one's grabbing you by the collar and dragging you off the stage. Uh, no, I was really careful in staying away from them. So that, I mean, <laughs> you don't want to get near the roadies. But then when Parrish did his book, he came to me and said, Ed, I need pictures, you know, from when you were on stage. And, and, uh, so it's interesting that later on he wants the pictures and, you know, while I was doing it, he didn't want to see any parts of me. Well, you know, it's funny. A couple of years ago, Paris said to me, he goes, man, I wish that we let you guys on stage and backstage. more." He said the same thing to me back in the day. Right. And then <clears throat> yeah. he said, and then he said to me, he goes, but we couldn't because we were doing so many drugs and there were so many women on stage and backstage that had no business being there with a variety of different crew and band members that had girlfriends or wives or whatever. And yeah. he basically said, you know, we, we couldn't have that shit photographed because we would all be incriminated in, in multiple ways. So, um, all right. So real quick, we're going to run through some of these shots here and move on from the Grateful Dead. We got Mickey Hart backstage warming up on a little drum pad. Great shot of Phil playing the Mission Control bass at, at Spartan Stadium at that 79 show. Jerry, I think, is this the same show? The color shot yeah, is also same, Spartan Stadium. Same show. Uh, and then, of course, these shots here, there's this one of Billy with the with the, the Beast um, playing. And these are sort of kind of famous early, early Beast shots. I remember them showing up in maybe Relics Magazine or somewhere, but they've been in books and so on and so forth. Because it Well, really Mickey actually invited me down to where he was building the Beast. Um, Bill Graham had a huge warehouse in South San Francisco and it, it was FM productions and where they would build all the facades for the large shows. And, uh, he invited me down and he and Greg Arico, the drummer for Sly and the Family Stone were there and they were, you know, constructing this, what you see here, this huge monstrous, uh, drum setup. Uh, so it was kind of nice to document that end of it, the, the creation of it. Right. Uh, here's Mickey on stage at that same Santa Barbara show Garcia yeah. backstage at the Warfield at the Bay area music awards. Yeah. I was getting um, the, uh, I was getting the musician of the year award musician. He should be, he's like the musician of the world award. Yeah. Um, uh, Jerry, beautiful shot of him singing into the microphone. And so really by the time the eighties rolled around, you were really slowing down on shooting stuff because you were starting a family and, and, uh, it was tough to make a living as a, as a music photographer. So you were, you know, you it were was. still shooting, but uh, uh, we'll talk more about that later. But where's this Garcia shot from? The one we're singing into the microphone in about 19. Uh, this one's um, uh, 81 at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. Nice. And then Bobby wearing his short shorts with the, 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 the skeleton horse and the skeleton man riding on it. That's and a Cal Calaveras uh um, when they uh, played with Santana uh, this, in the Sierra foothills. this right. Now, this shot is interesting only because that event was in 87. Now, right. I hadn't shot anything since 83. And so four years go by, I show up, you know, I'm figuring, okay, stage, carte blanche, all the access I need. And now Dennis McNally's in charge. Now, Dennis is a great guy. I love him. He's a good friend. But he turns to me and he says, Ed, you haven't been around for many years. You're only allowed to shoot the first three songs. And that's the way it was. It started out right in the mid 60s, mid, mid 80s. Yep. And I don't know how it started or why it started. The but rumor, I'm glad. the rumor is that it was Bob Dylan who insti instituted the three songs. I believe it. I believe it. But I, I, it made me feel like I made the right decision to get out. Right. Because access is key you know the best parts of a concert are at the end when they're the band is at their peak and the lights are up full and and you can't first three songs you're not you're just not capturing the band at their best yeah 
that's for sure. That is for sure. Did you get any shots of Carlos and the band playing together that night? I got, I got a couple. I did not. Actually, I was so disgusted at not having been been able to photograph the dead that I kind of, you know, stopped shooting and and went back and just enjoyed the show from the crowd. So I missed the shot of Carlos shooting, uh, playing with the band. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually did a photo shoot with Carlos Santana yesterday and uh, it was very fun. I actually gave him a different photo of him jamming with Jerry and uh, he was uh, he dug it. He was really happy about it. Uh, Garcia at the Bill Graham Memorial in Golden Gate Park in 1991. And then this next photograph is of Owsley, the ever elusive Owsley Stanley III. And uh, this photo is the the shot heard around the world when when Owsley died. It was just it is. He actually loved this photo. In fact, he asked me to make him a copy. And he was in San Rafael at the time uh, visiting for a while. And so I brought it to his his place. And, you know, he, he was really happy to get it. He sat me down and he pulled out some tapes and he put it on his Nagra recorder and he played me Miles Davis at the Fillmore that he recorded. I mean, Owsley recorded everything that the dead were a part of, including the opening bands. And of course, the Owsley Stanley Foundation is starting to release some of that stuff. But, you know, I was happy that he really liked this photo. You also started a relationship with um, another elusive Grateful Dead band member, Robert Hunter. Yeah. Um, you know, not really a, in the band, but in the band. I mean, just as important as every other band member in that band. And uh, uh, and you took a couple of photos that sort of became very well known. Um, you know, these ones of the bandana it, with the bandana on his head and, and or the scarf, I should say, in 76, kind of like the pirate look. It's a long scarf kind of coming down over his shoulder. This um, was taken back. This was taken at a uh, Grateful Dead auction behind the record factory store in San Rafael, which is really uh, a a dozen blocks away from Dead's rehearsal studio on one side and a dozen blocks away from where Terrapin Crossroads, Phil Lesser's restaurant is on the other side. They had a Grateful Dead auction and they were auctioning off, you know, uh, amazing original art from Mouse and Kelly and and, uh, to raise money for, I think, Mouse and Kelly. And at the time, everything was really cheap. And boy, I wish I had a lot of money then to buy that stuff. Right. Because it would have been, yeah, you would have been able to put all your kids through college if you had bought it all back then for 20 bucks. Yeah. Um, this next shot is uh, an interview happening at Front Street with uh, Hunter in the middle there. I guess that's Betty on the right. Is that Betty, Betty on the right? David Gans on the left doing an interview for BAM magazine. Right. And so I, I actually have some insider information. David Gans is working on a new book, uh, Photos and Stories. Uh, of his time photographing the Grateful Dead and doing all these interviews with them. He's written a lot about the Grateful Dead, but this is the first time that he's going to combine it all into a coffee table book and uh, put his photographs with his stories, very personal stories about, um, you know, why he was hanging out with Robert Hunter at Front Street and things like that. So I'm pretty sure that's going to come out uh, either late this year or early next year. So keep your uh, eyes and ears peeled. If you're listening to the Golden Road, I'm sure David will spill the beans at some point, but uh, keep your ears and eyes open for that one. Um, here's another shot of Hunter from that same interview, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, and then this is the one that's uh, another shot heard around the world. Hunter holding that that uh, horn with, uh, um, you know, the trumpet with the giant um, blues for Allah skeleton backdrop up there, which I'm guessing was maybe a backdrop from a stage set from a show. Possibly, and, and, you know, uh, Hunter used to play trumpet. I so he did not know that. Yeah, yeah, he he um, he it uh, he it was his idea to grab the trumpet jump up on the equipment case and pose in front of that backdrop. I mean, it's one of those gifts that, that keeps on giving. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a great shot. And it's a really iconic photo in, in Grateful Dead folklore. Um, here's Hunter in the middle with Cipollina and Donna Jean Godchow. And that sort of brings us over to John Cipollina, Quicksilver messenger service. Um, again, you were just, you're really just, were, were a fan of these guys and any opportunity that you could get to shoot them, you would shoot them. Yeah. Um, any particular stories about Cipollina or working with these guys? Uh, John Cipollina was just a, a warm, wonderful person. Um, and, and I just loved shooting him. I loved his guitar sound. I loved the way he looked on stage. Um, this next shot is uh, backstage at the Greek Theater in Berkeley when he showed up to play uh, to jam with the Grateful Dead. 
I and, love that. And that guitar, that Batman, you know, SG. Yeah. I mean, what a beautiful. And this guitar. is when I was, um, I don't know which gig this was or when this was, but I was starting to experiment with star filters. And so that's why that's a star on the, on the right there. And then the next shot is uh, him and his rehearsal studio in San Rafael. I, sh um, I showed up with a couple of friends and he's playing his guitar. And so we, we all just sort of sat down. My friend played piano. So he tinkled on the piano. My other friend picked up John's bass. And I sat down on the drums having no uh, rhythm whatsoever and tried to rap out a beat. So I guess I can say I played in a band with John Cipollina. <laughs> this last shot here that I'm looking at of Cipollina, this is um, uh, with a really low ceiling. That's the boarding house, correct? Actually not. This is the Keystone Berkeley. Oh. And this was the Rocky Sullivan band. Now, the Rocky, Rocky Sullivan is like, okay, who's that guy? He's a, he's a singer, songwriter from New York, hard rock guy. The key to this photograph is who's in the band. It was right. John, Cipoll John Cipollina. He's playing on a piano. I mean, the, the guitars are resting on a grand piano. The playing that piano is Nicky Hopkins. All, on drums is Joey Covington from The Airplane. And on bass is Mario Cipollina, John's brother, who was in Huey Lewis in the News. Who's on harmonica? Oh, that, that would be uh, Rocky Sullivan. Okay, got it. Yeah. And of course, Cipollina and uh, Nick Gravenites went on to do a lot of stuff together. Oh, you mean this shot of Silas, who's on harmonica? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's Billy Roberts, who wrote the song Hey Joe. Ah, okay. okay. So this is a total different gig. This is at the old Waldorf. This is a okay. band called The Seven Deadly Sins. And it's got everybody from Joey Covington on drums to uh, Boots Houston, who played with the Hoodoo Rhythm Devils, is Pete Sears next to him, bass player. Nick Gravidinus, John Cipollita, and Stevie Gurr. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, I was looking at the wrong shot. Apologies. The one before that where Cipollina's got the guitar on the piano, that's the one you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so, um, and that brings us to the last waltz. We're back to Winterland. Um, one of the most legendary concerts ever. Um, we've all seen the movie a hundred times. Uh, you were on assignment for BAM Magazine? Yes. All yes. access or just? No, 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 no. There are very few all access photographers, but um, uh, I was on assignment for BAM. Bill Graham put this concert together and he it was on Thanksgiving Day in 1976. He served Thanksgiving dinner to 5,000 people and with tables and, and tablecloths and everything and salmon flown in for those who didn't eat turkey. Uh, it was just an amazing thing. And while everybody was eating dinner, um, he had uh, the Berkeley Promenade Orchestra playing and he had professional waltzers waltzing <laughs> in front of the orchestra, which was set up in front of the stage. So after everybody was done with dinner, they started to remove the tables and then they started to, you know, take away the orchestra's uh, instruments and, and every st my stands and everything. And I was schmoozing. OK, I wasn't ready for it. There are other photographers who are right there ready to pounce on the stage when they let everybody go to the stage. So I kind of got pushed. I kind of got set up off to the side a little bit. And, and, and looking so, at some of my photos, I'm glad I did. But uh, you'll see this one. Uh, I assume you're showing the one of Rick Danko and Robbie Robertson. Sure, that's where I'm at right now. Yep. Okay. Uh, next one is Van Morrison with Rick Danko and Robbie. Um, and then Neil, Neil Young. Young. Mm -hmm. And Muddy Waters, uh, Bob Dylan, Neil and Joni. And then let me talk about this wide shot for a minute. At the encore, when everybody started to come out on the stage, I thought, oh, crap, there's no way I'm going to capture this correctly. And I've only been shooting for a year, right? There's no way I'm going to capture this correctly if I'm down in the front. So... I, I know winter like, like the back of my hand. I hightailed it up to the balcony, the side balcony. And my cousin was sitting in the first row of the side balcony. And I squeezed in with him and I was able to get shots like this. And um, uh, the next one, I don't know whether you want me to tell who everybody is. Real quick, let's do a little left to right here. So Richard Manuel, Garth Hudson, Dr. John, Neil Diamond, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, Ringo Starr on drums in the back, 
Yeah. I think that must Rick, be Rick Danko on Rick base. Rick Danko and Van Morrison is behind him. You can't see him. Got it. And then Dylan, Ronnie Hawkins, Robbie Robertson, Levon. And then all the way over on the side, uh, is that Clapton? Eric Clapton, Paul Butterfield, Bobby Charles, who wrote the song See You Later, Alligator, and was working with uh, the band on a bunch of stuff. Um, and Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie Wood, Wood from Ron the Stones. Wood. Right. Yeah. Amazing. What a yeah. lineup. And then, yeah, this next one here that you were about to say, this is the one of, uh, of um, uh, Dr. John Joni, Danko, Dylan, Ronnie Hawkins, Van Morrison yeah. in the back. Did you have... Uh, did you have uh, uh, a long lens and, and shorter lenses or all prime? Did you have a zoom lens? Because this is essentially the same jam, but in tighter. So did you have like a 135 and a 180 or something? Or? I probably had an 80 to 200 zoom. Uh -huh. um, my camera equipment was not top of the line. It was borrowed from people. I would only been shooting for a year. I didn't have a lot of money. I don't think I owned a camera. Uh -huh. I think I just, you know, had had friends who had cameras that loaned them to me. Right. Um, did, so, didn't, you, didn't you work in a camera store also? I worked at Brooks Cameras in San Francisco. So I was able to borrow equipment um, from the local Nikon dealer. And that was cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, and and this, this one here is uh, Ringo Starr kind of kissing the hand of Levon Helm. Well, I wouldn't say kissing. He's paying homage to Levon, which is a uh, kind of a cool image to, that I captured at the end. Yeah, for sure. And then we move on to the Blues Brothers. Is this closing a Winterland? This is closing a Winterland. So the last waltz was uh, Thanksgiving '76. This would be New Year's Eve '78. Is the last concert at Winterland, and um, uh, Bill Graham hired me to shoot this. And um, uh, it, it basically, you know, it's it's the Blues Brothers. They're, they're great, but if you look behind the Blues Brothers. Um, between the trumpet player and the horn player is Frankie Weir, Bob Weir's girlfriend. But to the right of the trumpet player is Spencer Dryden from the airplane. So with the, it, with the hat on. Yeah. So those guys were real interested in what was going on here with Belushi and Ackroyd also. I'm sure. Here's and a then, uh, stage, stage uh, flash on camera portrait of Belushi. Yeah. He, um, this was during the rehearsal, um, which was uh, the day of, the closing before they let the crowd in and Belushi posed for me, which was really nice of him. And then here's yeah. some, what looks like a, 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 a multiple, multiple exposure, but I think it's more like a strobe light. It is a strobe light. This was, um, uh, there was a, there was a song that they had a strobe light going and, and I, I had seen this technique done before you hold down the shutter and bulb setting and you just pan to the right. And I, I just, I think it's a fun shot of the Ackroyd and Belushi. Super cool. Super cool. Love it. I love all the Ackroyd faces on the left there with his, with his hand and then Belushi's hand up in the air like that. That's really great. Uh, all right, moving on. This is Jay Giles band with a bunch this of is, guests. It looks like the Mark first Mark. show at the Oakland auditorium when Bill Graham started putting on shows at the Oakland auditorium. And, and who, was on, who, was, who was on the bill besides Jay Giles? Can't tell you. Um, but closing out for the encore in this shot, you see Carlos Santana and Ronnie Montrose on the left. Uh, so you think that they were just invited guests by Bill to kind of christen the new room as opposed to like, cause I'm guessing that it wasn't Santana on the bill or Montrose. No, they, they it's just, possible. It's possible Montrose was on the bill, but I really, I don't recall. So right. I don't know the reasoning for that, for that, but there you go. And this next color shot, is that Peter Wolf from Jay Giles? Yeah, same show. There was a um, there's a runway coming out from the stage that Peter Wolf can go out on into the crowd. And I, I just like this shot. I love this shot because, you know, to me, it's the crowd that makes this shot. And, and, and if you look at it, because the, you know, you don't see anything else in the background. You're not seeing any more uh, audience or stands or lights. It almost looks like it's just like a, a fake television commercial or something. And these are all just extras, you know, like you don't know who the guy is with the glitter pants and everybody just all their all their faces and the adulation and the arms in the air. To me, it's just like this is just such a classic rock and roll yeah. shot. That's just Yeah, the audience definitely is what makes this shot. Yeah. Uh, Bob Marley, you were lucky enough to photograph Bob. And did you shoot him more than once? I shot him twice, but um, the first time the lights were so low. It was the Paramount Theater in Oakland. And it was hard to get anything decent. 
this was at the Greek theater in Berkeley. And I was right. I had a, a, a pit pass, I guess. And so I had, there, there was an area cordoned off that I could, that I could move around and I could get up close. So I could use maybe a shorter lens. And I captured a bunch of, of Bob. Um, and uh, I mean, he moves a lot, so it's it, hard to capture him. You're, you're pretty much self-taught as a photographer, correct? Yeah. I, I did take a few classes, but yeah. At this point, do you completely understand the relationship between shutter speed and, and aperture and film speed and things like that? Or oh, I understood that at the beginning because I was taught that by my friend, Bob Marks. Um, Got okay. Got it. So you were, you were aware and you were honing your skills and figuring out based on lighting. You know, people don't realize that a lot of shows in the 70s, I mean, the lighting was just very, very different than it is today. Yeah. And uh, um, you really needed technical skills to be able to expose film properly. I had an electronic one degree spot meter. So what I would often do is take a, take a reading off of performer's face. And I was able to set my uh, shutter speed and aperture that way. But after a while, you get, you get to know it. You don't need that. And right. Yeah. For so. sure. Another great Bob Marley shot. Uh, Leon Russell, beautiful, this, beautiful shot of a great man. Also, I love the reflection in his glasses. Also at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. Right. These uh, are all. These are all at the Greek. Let's talk about Linda Ronstadt for a second. So this is just such a beautiful shot, and in fact, it is so beautiful. The people who made the documentary last year about Linda Ronstadt, which won the Grammy, or did it win a Grammy or an Academy Award? I forget. I um, can't recall. Um, used your photo for the advertising poster for this documentary. Yeah. Um, do you know where they saw it? Was it on your website or was it published somewhere or was it random? Um, I'm, I'm represented, but because I don't shoot anymore, I'm not out there and people don't really know my name. I'm represented by Getty Images. So that's Absolutely. where most, most places look for, you know, for right. photos. Right. And that's, uh, I'm just not, I'm not shooting anymore. So I don't have that, um, that following. So like, like you do. Right. Right. Well, that's good. So, you know, they went to Getty and Getty was able to share it with them. Cause like you said, you're, you know, people aren't, you're not out there posting stuff on social media all the time and right. drawing people into what you're doing. So, um, you know, it's, it's just the, the way of the world here in terms yeah. of, uh, uh, the lifespan of us photographers, uh, great Bo Diddley shot. Now this, uh, uh, Bo Diddley here is opening for the clash of all of all bands. Okay. Where was, Where was the show? This was at the Berkeley Community Theater, okay. uh, which is really uh, right down the block from the Greek Theater. I mean, this is all Berkeley, um, and um, it was it was uh, it was a great show. I mean, Bo Diddley and the Clash. I mean, come on. And this is kind of a a, a Bill Graham billing. You know, yeah. he did that a lot in the '60s, sure. and I'm glad he kept doing it. Introduced a lot of people to a lot of good music. Yeah. Uh, Fleetwood Mac, is that Lindsey Buckingham here with Lindsay. the double neck guitar? Yeah, Lindsey Buckingham, also at the Berkeley Community Theater. Love the Stevie Nicks shot, the classic hat and tambourine. You don't always need to see a performer's face to know who it is. Yeah. Uh, Lowell George, legendary Lowell George. This looks like he was shot not too long before he died. Uh, I don't know when he passed. Um, this was also the Berkeley Community Theater, and I happened to be uh, in first row seats and I, I was able to get a lot of great shots of Lowell. Right. June of 79 is when Lowell George died. Um, the, the police as young, as young lads. Um, yeah. Amazing. I mean, look at sting, man. Just amazing. This was one of their, uh, this might've been their first tour. Um, they were, this was in 1980. So they had just put out, um, I don't know if it was their first album, but they, they had a following, but it certainly hadn't exploded yet. All right. right. To the mega stars they became. In fact, they showed up for this in-store record appearance at Rather Rip Records in Berkeley, driving an old beat up station wagon. I mean, they weren't limousines or anything like that. Um, yeah, I, wonder, I wonder what venue they were playing at, what size venue they were playing at. Oh, this I know point. what size venue. They were playing on, on the Berkeley campus at Zellerbach. Oh, OK. Got it. So, yeah. So right. theater, a couple 1,500, 2,000 people, something like that. They were, um, and in fact, I, I I saw that show. It was either the day before this shoot or the day or the day of. I can't remember, um, but it was a great show. I ended up shooting that one too. Chuck Berry. Uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, Chuck Berry was playing 
at a, a horse race track in Albany, which is just next town over from Berkeley. It's, it really is on the edge of the San Francisco Bay. And um, he was playing between like the fifth and sixth races. And they thought they had built this, uh, uh, this stage um, and the audience were, was in the stands really far away. So he had nobody to relate to, right? So he never travels with a band. He hired Billy C. Farlow band. Billy C. Farlow was the uh, lead singer for Commander Cody. Right. Um, and in fact, uh, my friend Billy Philadelphia was in the band. He's, he's a great pianist. Um, but Chuck had nobody to relate to. So he did his duck walk across the stage. I was standing there on the, uh, below the stage, really, off the stage, and posed. he posed for me while I focused and got ready and took the picture. I gave him a thumbs up, and he just turned around. He smiled at me, turned around, and went the other way. <laughs> I got to uh, love that. What a yeah. Uh, Bowie, back in the 80s, I'm guessing? Yeah. This was, this was um, uh, actually in 78. Okay. And, and this was, now we start to get into concerts. I, I shot a lot at the Open Coliseum. The major bands were coming to the Open Coliseum. That was a big uh, arena. So um, this was Bowie in 78. Able, but you were still able to shoot from in front of the stage in the pit, right? There, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there was no pit. There was, it was all, a, it was a seated show. Most of these shows were seated. And through BAM Magazine and the fact that Bill Graham's people knew me, I would often get seats in the first six rows. And with a long lens, I was able to get shots like this. And the next one of Dylan was also Oakland um, Coliseum. That's a 78. And then um, the next shot of Keith Richards, who was, who, who was playing with the new Barbarians. Now they had Ron Wood, um, uh, Stanley Clark on bass, uh, Keith Richards and uh, Bobby Keys on sax. Um, and this was in 79. Yeah. That was a, a, a solo record. I think that technically was a Ron Wood project that, um, he brought, put that band together for. And I think on drums was uh, Zigaboo Modaliste from the meters. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, love this shot of Bruce Springsteen and the big man, Clarence Clemens. Also at, uh, Oakland Coliseum. Yeah. And then uh, Queen, you're lucky enough to have photographed the legendary. Oh my God. Let Freddie me tell Martin. you about this weekend. Um, uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, not the picture I just showed you, because the picture I just showed you was in 1980 of, of Springsteen and the big man. But the weekend I photographed Queen, the night before I was at Winterland photographing Bruce Springsteen playing for four hours. This is 1978. And, and he, he just goes nuts all over the stage. You can get so many great pictures of him. And then the next night, Instead of going back to another Bruce Springsteen show, I went to see Queen at the Open Coliseum. And I'm really glad I did, because how many times do you get to photograph Freddie Mercury? Uh, he is so photogenic. Yeah. Oh, my God. Look at this. I mean, this shot here with the, the biker black, you know, gay leather. I mean, it's just so classic and um, amazing. And, uh, you know, here's another. The color shot is great. Love that shot. Um, Crosby, Nash and Young. No stills. What's, what's up with this? This was down in Santa Cruz, um, and it was a Crosby Nash concert. And, and Neil Young lived down the road uh, and showed up. And, and as soon as I saw that, I went right up to the lip of the stage, and that's where I stayed the entire time, um, you know, ruining my knees but taking lots of pictures. Um, so there's a couple here. Right. What year is this? Um, this was 77. Okay. That's close. Uh, Carlos Santana, uh, mid to late eighties, about 87. I'm guessing this is from, this is from 87 from Calaveras where the dead and, and Santana play. Now th there's an interesting story about this photo. Um, this was taken backstage and I, I went there with a friend of mine who had backstage passes and I get there and a good friend of mine named Carl Kunstorf that I've known forever. Um, he was backstage with Carlos. Now, I didn't realize this because I haven't talked to Carl in a while, but OK, let me let me take a side story uh, because I love music so much. 
I got into photography. But because I love music so much, I also started since like maybe 71 collecting live concert recordings on tape. And back then it was reel to reel. And I everything, anything that the Grateful Dead played, I would collect. And, and later on, um, it got to be cassettes. And I would trade with people all over the United States, but all over the world, Japan, Germany, France. And, you know, you'd send them a dozen concerts on cassette and they would send you some. Well, I, I, Carl was one of my trader friends. And I didn't realize as I was getting a lot of jazz from Europe, I didn't realize that Carl was turning Carlo Santana onto my tapes. So when Carl told Carlos, introduced me to Carlos and said, Ed's the one who's been supplying me with the tapes that I give you. He gave me a big bear hug and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, so I, I, I managed to get some nice shots of Carlos backstage before he wrapped his hair behind him and went on to play the show. And I shot the entire Santana set from on stage. And then of course, for the dead, it was first three songs, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Second class citizen. Yeah. There's a, a live shot of Carlos. Um, then we roll into Hot Tuna, Yorma. Um, you were a big airplane fan going way back to high school, uh, the Fillmore East. Uh, you started shooting Yorma because they were assignments mostly for BAM magazine, correct? Well, there were, there were assignments that I requested. I mean, I loved Hot Tuna. I loved, the, you know, members of the airplane. But yeah, if there was a Hot Tuna story in BAM, I wanted it. Um, this particular one was taken at the old Waldorf and um, Yorma is talking guitar with none other than Steve Kimmock, who was in the Goodman Brothers band who opened for Hot Tuna that night in 77. Wow. I didn't realize that's who that was. Kimmock. Wow. Yeah. This is hanging in Kimmock's studio right now. Uh, he loves is. this shot. There um, we go. Yeah. Love this shot of Yorma with the head back and color with the Speedo shirt that he used to wear all the time in the 70s. And this is a great shot of him in this old car. Who's Was this his car? That, that uh... This is his 57 Chevy. He loved working on cars. And he showed up for a BAM photo shoot and interview uh, at the Automat Recording Studio in San Francisco and he, with, with this car. And he pulls up. And um, uh, Sidney Sharp was the one doing the interview. I was doing the photos. He says, climb in. So she gets in shotgun and I get in the back and he drives us around San Francisco in this car. And I'm shooting in the back seat. I'm shooting him driving and stuff like that. So after he pulls back up to the, to the front of the studio, I asked him if he would pose for me in the car. And, and this is one of his favorite photos. He loves this shot. Yeah, that's um, great. And then we went inside and did more sh more photos. Uh, quickie portrait. Uh, yes, this same on? same place. Same place from the same shoot. Okay. Yeah, same shoot. Uh, Jack Cassidy is this in the airplane mansion at twenty four hundred Fulton? Yes, it is. This was um, of course after the airplane had moved out, and um, it was now the offices of Grunt Records and. Um, uh, Cassidy uh, posed at the, at the landing, the stairway landing, and there was some light coming in from the window. It was really nice. And, and the RCA Victor dog, of course, has a, a, an arrow in its chest, which I thought was really cool. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of stuff uh, with, with Yorma and Jack. Yeah, I love this color shot here of Yorma and Jack. This uh, is at the backyard of his house when I went over there for another BAM photo shoot. Um, Yorma's house? Yeah. I wonder if this is the house in St. Francis Woods. I think it is. Yeah, he, that's right down the street from where I live. Um, all right, here we go. Back to the tribal stomp with Country Joe uh, uh, McDonald in the background. Looks like Barry Melton. Um, what, right. was the, what was the tribal stomp and where was it and when did when was, it, was it? A it was a show at the Greek Theater, uh, October 1st, 1978. And uh, for those who, who know about uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, concerts, you'll know that Bill Graham put on uh, concerts and Chet Helms put on concerts in the 60s. Okay. Um, and this was put on by Chet Helms. I mean, he didn't, he hadn't been doing concerts for a long time, but he put, this is called Chet Helms' Tribal Stomp. And he brought in all the old San Francisco bands. There was Country Joe and the Fish, there was Lee Michaels, there was Canned Heat, there was the Paul Butterfield Band. 
And Country Joe dressed up the part in the 60s garb with face paint and everything. He was a tribe member. This next shot here, Chambers Brothers Band with Canned Heat. Is that what's going on? This is the guitarist and and Bob the Bear Height on the right uh, are from Canned Heat. And they had the Chambers Brothers singing with them, um, which is really rare. Uh, And the guy with his arms up throwing the peace sign is none other than Lester Chambers, uh, who's a very good friend and lives in in Petaluma, where I live, and is now uh, singing with Moon Alice. Nice. And here's Bob the Bear, solo shot of him. He certainly yeah. is a bear. Yes. Uh, is this shot of Mike Bloomfield, Paul Butterfield, and Elvin Bishop from the Tribal Stomp? Yes, that's the, the, the um, Paul Butterfield Band reunion. And that uh, just nighttime. And then here's another shot of Paul and... Bloomfield, legendary, legendary guitar player who died too young. Uh, One this of my is favorites. Day on the Green. Uh, Day on the Green shows were big, giant stadium concerts that Bill Graham put on, I think, be- be- beginning in about 72 or 73, somewhere around there. Um, this is one of them. It's so I always, always found it so interesting that they just, you know, cordoned off the, um, the infield, right? Nobody was allowed yeah. to be on the infield. Um, and it always this- just amazing to just see the rest of the sea of people everywhere. I, I, yeah. I just wanted to give a context to people who have never been to a day on the green so they could see what this was. And um, the facades uh, but around the stage are what Bill Graham and his crew put together. They were different for each show. Um, and I would, I, I tried to uh, go all the way to the very top of the stands as far away from the stage as possible, just to get at least one uh, shot of the whole stadium for each show I shot. And I shot a lot of days on the green. Um, these were great shows. Is the, uh, is the area that we're looking at behind the stage, the, those bleachers that are empty, are, is that actually backstage? Are those like guests or are those? Yes. That's all yes. just guests that are back. It's there. all just guests backstage. Yeah. Got and, it. And, Love the shot of Sammy Hagar, lean and mean, the red rocker. But of course, you know, super controversial now with the Confederate flag out there in the, in the audience. You know, I always I always assumed that the Confederate flag was there because Leonard Skinner was playing that day. But I looked it up and Leonard Skinner was not playing that day. So who knows why somebody was showing, you know, waving a, a Confederate flag? I don't know. Yeah, well, because people were, you know, not as well informed as we are today. Uh, love the shot of Sammy. Always so fun to shoot. He's just, he is, he is a rock star. Yes, um, he is. Eddie money on stage, right? That's who this is. Also a big stadium concert. Yes. Probably, probably singing yes. Two tickets to paradise. Yeah. Um, that was the same show. 1979. Right. So yeah, so it was a hit. And, uh, you know, also, uh, Eddie was managed by Bill Graham presents. So, um, you know, it was all, all in the family there. Love this shot of the Stones, Mick, Keith, Charlie. Uh, but this is a stadium show, and it almost looks like you're at the same level as them. How are you up so high? Well, um, I didn't have uh, passes for this one. I didn't have uh, pit access or stage access or anything. So I was out in the crowd, and I had um, I had somebody construct a wooden stool, a step stool, that that was put together by uh, with a socket wrench and some bolts. And I, it came apart, fed in my backpack. And then when I got to where I was going to stand, I put it together and I was like eight inches higher than I would normally be. And I'm pretty short. So it put, probably put me as uh, high as, uh, uh, you know, normal people. <laughs> anyway, it got me to the point where I can at least shoot and not get people's heads in the way. Right on. Uh, this is Neil, G- Neil, Geraldo. Neil Geraldo from uh, the Rick. Rick Derringer band. I just really like this so shot. He was in Rick Derringer's band before hooking up with Pat Benatar and, and, and being band leader for her and eventual <laughs> husband. Correct. Yes, that's correct. And in fact, Rick Derringer's band opened for Led Zeppelin. Um, and just which, a shot here. And so are you on stage for this photograph? I am not. Now you remember what you were talking about the people behind the stage or they guests or what at the beginning of the Led Zeppelin set, they weren't allowing us in the pit yet. And, and being on stage, I only know one photographer who made it on stage for that show, and that was Baron Woolman. Uh, so I was behind the stage, but there was a section of the backdrop that was open. So I could shoot through the backdrop, right? 
and with a long lens and capture and capture Robert Plant with the audience in the background. So it looks like I'm on stage. And I got some good stuff with Jimmy Page that way too, before I headed down into the pit to shoot uh, shots like, like the next one. Right, and you only would get three songs, but I, lo I also just love the hair. I did not get three songs. I shot the entire show, Jay. Ah. The three songs didn't come up till the mid eighties. This was, okay, got it. Uh, and you had a photo pass and you still got to shoot the whole show. Very interesting. Yes. Um, love this shot of Jimmy Page. It almost looks like he's, you know, G-force on his face there. I know. With the wind and everything. Uh, we get to The Who, Another Day on the Green. Keith Moon with Roger Daltrey playing a little harmonica. This was um, The Who dead. And right. And this, this shot of Pete jumping in the air has always been a, a favorite of mine. It's just such a perfect, perfect capture of lightning in a bottle. You know, Thank just you. really stellar photograph. Um, and, 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 and I want to point out that when Ed took this photo, when we shot in the seventies, there was no autofocus, okay? <laughs> right? This is real. This is like, you know, being ready and waiting for that moment and being prepared. And it's possible he did a jump right before it where Ed was getting his focus organized and he was sort of pre-focused and shot it. I'm guessing because, you know, this kind of stuff happens in a split second. When, when bands are jumping and you're manually focusing a camera. So kudos for you for capturing the magic there. Thank you. Um, here's uh, Roger Daltrey uh, being a, a beefcake uh, a Playgirl magazine model. Um, I mean, not one, one, not one hair on his chest there, which is, you know, <laughs> it just certainly is amazing. And then another classic Pete Townsend um, uh, windmill shot. When you were shooting color, were you shooting slide film? Yes. And uh, so you figured out exposure. Uh, slide film was very slow. I, most of the time I was shooting uh, Ektachrome 160 pushed to 320. Right. Um, I, I, I mean, you can't really, you can't push Kodachrome, even though you get the brighter reds and stuff like that. If I was shooting a day on the green, I might have some Kodachrome, uh, but you're not going to get your fast shutter speed to stop right. Pete Townsend's arm. There was a brief period in the 90s when Kodak released the secret formula and licensed about seven labs in the United States to process Kodachrome. Up until that point, the only place you could get Kodachrome developed was at Kodak. And as you said, you couldn't push your film. Right. They released it at around that same time. They also came out with Kodachrome 200. Okay. I don't know if you remember that you might not have been shooting anymore. Um, but so for years, it was only Kodachrome 64. Very right. slow film. And then eventually they released Kodachrome 200. And when they released it to these labs, one of the seven labs in the country was the new lab here in San Francisco owned yeah. by a guy named Sam Hoffman. Good friend of mine has a great lab here in San Francisco that does digital printing now uh, light source. And uh, anyway, so they could push your Kodachrome film at the independent labs. So for a brief period in the nineties, you could take your Kodachrome 200 and push it to 400 um, and it lasted a very brief period of time and then it was gone and then they stopped licensing it. And maybe you saw a story somewhere along the way where there was the last final roll of Kodachrome and this guy shot it and that right. developed it. And that was the end of Kodachrome, <laughs> uh, but we all loved our Kodachrome. Thank you, Paul Simon. Uh, and then here is the same show, which is the Grateful Dead on stage. So it was the right. Grateful Dead and the Who, and it was a two night run at the stadium. And one day the Who opened and the next day the Dead opened or maybe vice versa. I don't remember which way it went, but uh, yeah. I've seen many photos from the show. And again, it's just, you know, these guys are are playing on a, at a stadium and they're three feet apart from each other. You yeah. know, now bands in arenas are, are 15 feet away from each other. You know, it's like a. It's, uh, it's all spread out. And back then everything was so compressed, which I thought was also made things great. Um, this, this show with the dead, you know, I, I, um, uh, I was out in the audience. I didn't have any passes or anything after the show. Uh, uh, Gerilyn, Mickey's, Mickey's uh, significant other um, said to me, why didn't you call me? I would have given you a stage pass, you know, what can I, I tell you? Uh, Santana on stage at a big old stadium, Oakland Stadium. Another Oakland day on Stadium, day on the green with Sheila E on the right. Yes. Yep. Uh, Peter Frampton at day on the green. Yes. Uh, Neil Sean from Journey with that afro. Neil's Neil's always been photogenic. 
uh, and then we roll into some jazz and that, and you kind of, uh, what, what made you start shooting jazz? You're a rock guy. I mean, maybe you love the music or were they assignments? I, or I've always, I've always loved jazz. Like uh, when I was telling you about trading tapes, um, the jazz was a lot, I was trading a lot of jazz. I was bringing in, uh, a lot of jazz from Europe, um, live concerts. And I just always loved jazz. So I, I ended up shooting, uh, the Berkeley jazz festival at the Greek theater for three years in a row. Uh, 78, 79, and 80. Nice. And, you know, you could see the contrast in shooting jazz musicians uh, versus shooting rock musicians. Rock musicians tend to hide in their trailers or dressing rooms. Jazz musicians would, would sit down and talk to you, ask you, oh, how do I, you know, help me use my camera or, or uh, just talk. It was, it was a lot freer. It was a lot looser. Um, and I just, I love these musicians. And of course I had complete access, which is always nice uh, for these shows. And that's Oscar Peterson, uh, the great pianist. And mm -hmm. I think I love this besides the fact that there's a smile on his face. I love the sweat dripping down to his yeah, eyes. Me too. Yeah. Uh, next one, Sonny Rollins. Is he getting ready to go sit in with somebody or is he's he getting ready to do his set and he's behind the, um, uh, the, the PA amplifiers. Yep. I just thought it was a unique, yeah, uh, photograph. Just also, just love he's wearing the the Chuck Taylor low tops. You know, super super cool. Yeah, super super really good time capsule photograph. Uh, Betty Carter. Betty Carter, brilliant vocalist. Um, Dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie. Okay. Legendary Jaco Pastorius. Yeah, with Weather Report. Oh, um, he's playing with Weather Report. And is this Weather Report also with Herbie Hancock? Uh, no, Herbie Hancock was doing his own thing. Um, but he was in Weather Report at one point, right? No, Herbie no. was okay. No, Joe, Joe Zawinul was the keyboard. Oh, Joe, right, got it, got it. Got it. Okay, I'm just report. confusing things. I'm not a huge jazz aficionado. I will admit that. I'm sorry. Well, um, that will sit down someday. I'll turn you on to stuff. Uh, if you listen to my radio show, you'll learn. All right. I mean, I'd listen to some jazz, but you know, like I'm I'm a Miles guy and a Coltrane guy and. You know, I don't go, I don't, I don't go deep and wide. I've listened to, I, I've listened to a bunch of Herbie, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm a rock guy. I, I'm weird. You know, I, I mean, I like listening to that stuff, but uh, it's, it's few and far, few, fewer and farther in between than uh, me listening to, to rock and roll. Um, Carlos and John McLaughlin. Yeah. Carlos, uh, they were both playing the Greek at the, for the jazz festival. And Carlos was playing with, uh, I'm not sure what it may have been with Herbie. And John McLaughlin walks out and starts playing, you know, the neck of, of Carlos's guitar and they were having a blast. So this is happening on stage. This isn't a backstage moment. Right. This is happening on stage. Uh, the nuns. Then we get to punk. Punk was a, a really a, grew up in San Francisco and New York and, um, you know, San Francisco was a great place for punk. They had the Mabuhay Gardens was a was a wonderful um, club for the punk did, did, punk did band. You shoot a bunch? Did you shoot at the Mab Gardens? I shoot. I shot. I shot a little bit because when punk was starting out, I was start. I was leaving. You know, photography. Okay. Uh, I, this was seventy seven. Although I was I was still in it, but I just wasn't into punk music. Like you're not into jazz. I wasn't into punk, but I appreciated the visual nature of it. Right, now, right. this 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 is the nuns, the nuns, um, probably their claim to fame, other than maybe a few of their records were was the fact that they opened for the Sex Pistols at Winterland, the Sex Pistols last show. But the nuns uh, in the middle there is is Jennifer Miro. But to her right is Alejandro Escovedo, which um, he's he's a very popular Tex-Mex singer songwriter right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they were at the time. They were living in an apartment in the same house as my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And um, so they were living in the front apartment and she was living in the back. So they were really good friends. And they, you know, I, she introduced me to them. And at the time, this was 70, early 77, I was kind of learning my craft. Okay. And so I, I was taking a couple of classes at the Academy of Art College and one of my assignments was to go photograph a, a portraits, a, um, environmental portraits of, of a person in their, in their nature, natural environment. So I picked Alejandro Escovedo and I 
took pictures in his bedroom, posing outside on the porch, things like that. And, and recently, oh, I don't know, three, four years ago, I was able to run into him at uh, a local theater that he was playing at. And I gave him a, a, a photo book that I put together, all the photos I took of him over the years. It just blew his mind because he didn't even remember that stuff. Very cool. Uh, Iggy Pop. Oh, my God. What a great show this was. This was at the old Waldorf in San Francisco. Uh, this was in 1977. And uh, I was right up against the stage. The stage was very low and Iggy was swinging his mic stand all over the place. I thought I was going to get knocked out, but um, uh, he was incredibly uh, photogenic. Great, great musician to photograph. He, he would do anything like put this chair on uh, around his head. You know, it's interesting. I, 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 the only way I can show this is on my phone here. <laughs> this is another angle from that same show and that same exact shot that you're getting. And this is taken by Chester Simpson, who I mentioned earlier is gonna be on our program, Photos with Stories on May 18th. And uh, Chester just sent me this a few minutes ago because he knew that we were talking and he figured you were gonna show your photo. So it's just interesting, you know, like that same epic moment with the chair around his head. You Dueling know, Iggy's, Dueling yeah. Iggy's. And, and Chester was just a little bit to my right and uh, he actually has a picture of me in his photo of me taking pictures of Iggy. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, super cool. And another this, another Iggy shot. Now, this, this is a really this is an interesting photograph and an interesting story, because um, first of all, I mean, look at how young Iggy looks. I mean, he almost even doesn't look like Iggy. He looks more like, you know, an alien or something. Those big eyes and that big head and that skinny frame. But this photo became a very, very renowned piece of artwork by a very famous uh, artist named Shepard Ferry, uh, mostly known for his Obama uh, 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 poster, the, the Hope poster. Um, but uh, here's the poster that Shepard Ferry did. And I'm sure most of you people know who Shepard Ferry is at this time. How did, you, how did he pick your photo and make this poster. I'm going to kind of go back and forth between the two images so people can kind of see his rendition, which is up now versus your original photograph and his interpretation of it. How did, he this, and, how did this go about? He, uh, he and Iggy went through hundreds of pictures to find the right one. And they were really looking for the eyes. Okay. And they loved this picture. The eyes just popped out and they chose this. And so we worked out a deal. And um, years later, I ended up meeting Shepard because he was doing a gallery thing in San Francisco. And he was just so gracious and so happy to meet me. And what a nice guy. But uh, yeah, um, uh, he, in fact, in fact, uh, I asked him if he would have Iggy sign a, a print for me. Um, and he ended up sending me his only copy of his signed Iggy print. So I've got a print signed, one of these art, art prints signed by Iggy and Shepard. That's amazing. Yeah, I've met Shepard once at a gallery opening also, and he was very, very kind. Um, very cool and just such a legendary artist. Uh, the Ramones. Uh, where's the shot at? This was at the Old Waldorf. Uh, this was backstage. They were hanging out, but this was actually a, they were being interviewed by a TV station, I believe. So there are a bunch of photographers there uh, shooting in, you know, before and after the interview. And um, so it was nice to get them up, you know, to po pose uh, all of them together. Yeah, for sure. And there are these, all these live shots from the same show. We have Joey. Yes. Um, uh, Edie. Who's on, ba who's on Edie. base? Edie. Edie. Edie Ramon. Yeah. Right. I love the both of these shots getting a little bit of air here. The first one, the vertical, and then yeah. the other one where he started sort of doing the split. Um, what a fun band to photograph. Just, you know, such classic, classic time period. Um, Very loud. This is <laughs> of, of Ed, you mentioned your radio show. Um, where can people listen to your radio show and when? Um, I have two radio shows I've been doing for the last two or three years. Uh, I have a jazz show on Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, time. Um, and I have a live archive show on Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And the live archive show is, you, you heard me talk about all those tapes that I was trading for the last 40 years or so. I'm taking those tape tapes, those recordings, which are all soundboard, good quality recordings, and I'm playing that music 
on my live archive show. And are if you, you go are you, to- Are you digitizing those tapes? Yes, they've been digitized. And um, if you go to kpca.fm, you can find out uh, more about the station and the schedule. You can listen to it online. You can also listen to it after the fact at mixcloud.com slash live archive show or mixcloud.com slash jazzed. Excellent. Um, I've got oh. some questions for you, Ed, that, that um, Joe and Harrison have sent over. Um, perhaps this question is a cliche, but do you have a favorite photograph that you've ever taken? And that's by Davy Cat asked that question. Um, no, it's, it's not really a cliche. Um, I, I, I don't have a favorite, but I do have, I think, I think my favorites are the ones that people enjoy the most. Because if you're getting a lot of pleasure out of my photography, the ones that are getting the most pleasure are the ones that I like the most too. And probably the Grateful Dead from behind the stage at Winterland is one of my favorites. Um, the one of Bob Marley sticking his arm up in the air, grasping for, for uh, the spotlight. Um, those were both moments in time. They, they were captures that if there was one second or two seconds on either side of that, it wouldn't have been the same. Right. Um, are you familiar with, um, this is a question from somebody named MP Gallagher. Are you familiar with NFTs and do you have any plans to put some of them on the market? Um, I have been instructed by my daughter to, to do so. And I know Je uh, Jay, you, you're starting to do that. We just um, released, uh, we just released my first ones, uh, yesterday and the day before. So if you want to look for my NFTs, you can go to a website called that's fucking amazing.com. And you can see my NFTs. Uh, we did a 420 drop and a bicycle day drop. Some Grateful Dead, some Keezy Leary Owsley, some, some uh, uh, Snoop Dogg on 420. So uh, that's fucking amazing.com. But Ed, your daughter is instructing you to do so. So you're trying to figure it out, I guess. Um, I haven't started looking into it. Uh, and I tell you, these radio shows keep me very busy. My photography stuff keeps me busy, but I haven't, I haven't started looking into it. Maybe you'll uh, teach me one day. All right. I'll, when I learn how it all works myself, <laughs> I have young people helping me also. Oh, uh, uh, Hot Pink Purple wants to know, what's your craziest backstage story? Oh, wow. Um, craziest backstage story. Well, it's, it's not a matter of uh, snorting cocaine off of uh, um, uh, hot women's butts. I mean, that, that's not happened. Um, it was, it's, it's mostly um, hanging, you know, with uh, members of the band. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a story that happened before I started taking pictures. And, um, and this was uh, a story that, um, of meeting Jerry Garcia. Uh, when Jerry was in 73, Jerry was playing in Garcia and Saunders and in the band was Tom Fogarty from Creedence Clearwater Revival. Um, and back then it was, you know, the band would play a show and they just hang out afterwards and you, everybody gave to talk. It was, it was very loose. Uh, so I went up to Tom Fogarty and I said, you know, I, I I'm trying, I'd like to learn to be a recording engineer. I was serious. And he's, I said, um, do you have any tips? And he said, well, I'll tell you what, we're recording down at Fantasy Records tomorrow night. Why don't you come down and I'll show you around. And I show up and there's Garcia and Saunders. And um, I'm not sure whether they were recording a Tom Fogarty or a Merle Saunders uh, uh, album. But, um, you know, it was really nice to sit in the control room and watch Garcia plug into the board and overdub a lead uh, stuff like that. Um, and Tom Fogarty was just the gentleman and actually did show me around because um, at Fantasy Records, they not only recorded, they actually produced the actual albums in the same facility. Very cool. Um, I think you already answered this question, but I'll, ans I'll ask it. What made you stop shooting photos? Um, in, I stopped shooting really in the early eighties. Um, but, um, I was, I got married in 1980, um, met my wife a few years before that she had already had a son. And so I had an immediate family 
and photography just wasn't going to cut it. I never was a full-time photographer. I was always working at Brooks Cameras or somewhere else in addition to doing photography. Um, but I realized I needed to support my family, and so I found a real job. Not saying yours isn't a real job, Jay, but you work at hard. You work at it harder than most people. Thank you. Um, all right. Somebody wants to know: Are you still avidly, avidly exploring new jazz? And if so, do you have any recommendations? Uh, I am avidly exploring new jazz. Um, there is a there is a, a a band you should look into called the Third Mind um, that was going to play San Francisco until the uh, coronavirus hit. But um, check out the Third Mind CD and um, yeah, listen to my jazz show uh, Mondays 4 p.m. Pacific on KPCA.fm. All right. Um, any plans to put out a book? No. I've been told I should. Um, none other than Stevie Van Zandt swore I should put out a book, but I, I have no plans. Did you have any, uh, somebody wants to know if you had any other interactions with Iggy Pop uh, besides him being on stage. Did you have any backstage interaction with him? No. No. And, no. and another question is, and I think I know the answer, um, do you feel like you were able to capture more emotion in your offstage or onstage photos? And you're mostly were a live shooter. You did was, backstage stuff, but you know, there's a few classic ones like Hunter and stuff like that. But um, I was definitely a live shooter um, working for a magazine like BAM magazine. I did go on assignments to shoot posed photos at people's homes. Um, uh, some of the Bay Area musicians like Billy C. Farlow, uh, uh, but um, for the most part, I was a live shooter and I, and that's what I loved. I love live music and that's why I wanted to shoot live music. My, the whole reason I became a photographer and to shoot concerts was to get closer to the music. Cause for me, it's all about the music. Right on. Um, I've got a slide up here that, uh, talks about the, uh, a little, uh, art gallery at the relics marketplace. So relics marketplace.com slash Pearlstein. Uh, you just su uh, submitted some photos that are available for purchase. So if you guys want to go check that out, uh, looks like there's four different shots. Garcia, the, the legendary March 77 Winterland shot from the balcony behind that beautiful Bob Marley photo and Bob and Jerry backstage at the Cow Palace in 76 uh, uh, getting ready to go on stage. So uh, check out the relicsmarketplace.com and uh, check out some of Ed's work. You can purchase there. Ed, thank you so much for joining us on Photos with Stories. Been a fan of your work for a long time. It was great to hear some of the backstory on some of these photos that I've been seeing since I was a teenager. You're a few years older than me. Um, I didn't really start shooting until 78. Um, you graduated from high school in 71. I graduated in 79. So that makes you two years older than me. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so you got a little bit of a head start, but you know, I feel like I saw, I've been seeing your photos since I was a teenager. Um, or thereabouts. So um, thank you again. Uh, I want to remind everybody, my next show is with Chester Simpson. Chester was a Bay Area photographer for a long time in Washington, D.C. now. That will be on May 18th, which is a Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, 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 10 p.m. Eastern. How to do the math in my head there for a second. Sorry. Um, too many time zones in my brain. And um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us online and you can find us on Facebook. Are you on social media anywhere, Ed? Um, just on Facebook. You can look me up at Ed Perlstein, or you can go to my website at musicimages.com. You can always reach me through there. All right. And I'm Jay, uh, Jay Blakesburg on Instagram and Jay Blakesburg Photography on Facebook. So you can check me out there. If you have any questions, shoot me a message on any of those platforms. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. It's really been great to hear your stories and thank, thanks for having me. Your photos. All right. You're welcome. We'll see you again soon when the real world continues to uh, the planet resets and we get out there again. Cheers, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>